Hey everybody, I'm Scott Weichel. You're listening to My Kind of Country. Thanks so much for joining us on a Monday night. It's an honor to have this lady on the show with me tonight. Her husband is one of the greatest steel guitar players in all of country music history, just being inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame. The first steel guitarist to be inducted and uh, certainly well deserved because he has played on so many hit records over the years including Porter Wagner, Jerry Lee Lewis, uh, Tammy Wynette, Charlie Rich, Lynn Anderson and of course George Jones. He stopped loving her today. The list goes on and on. Um, a great musician, a producer. He did it all in country music and there would be a lot less good country music if it wasn't for Pete Drake and it's an honor to welcome Rose Drake to my kind of country tonight. Rose, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Thank you, Scott, for having us visit. Well, first of all, congratulations. Uh, it's, a, it's a long overdue honor, and it's so nice to see that uh, Pete is being inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame this year. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, it is long overdue, but we're excited about it. I wish Pete was here to enjoy the evening, but um, we'll just pay tribute to his music and to his hard work and all of his talent that he had and enjoy it with all of his children and his grandchildren. Well, before we start talking about uh, Pete's career in music, tell me a little bit about how you and Pete met and tell me a little bit about your life together. I actually met Pete backstage of the Grand Ole Opry. My mother was a big country music fan, so... When I got my driver's license, then she needed to go to the Opry every week. And so we did, and we got to know people, and I met him backstage. I was a big fan of Hank Williams' songwriting, and I had decided that I wanted to be in the music business, but I wanted to be with songwriters. So eventually, Pete had already started a publishing company, and... When I decided I wanted to be in the music business, then he said, no, you need to to go get a trade of some sort. Women aren't supposed to be in the music business. It's not a good business for women. And I didn't want to be an entertainer. I just wanted to be around songwriters. So eventually, uh, he would let me come to his office in the afternoons. And back then, it was 45s. We would ship out 45s of songs that he had published and owned. And I just gradually learned the business because he would say, I was going to Vanderbilt Nursing School, and then he would say, I don't want to do this. I don't really like to do this because all he wanted to do was play his guitar. So I'd say, well, I can take care of that. So eventually he hired me to take care of the publishing. Then after a while, we started the record label. Then we bought a studio building. Then he decided that, um, you know, he wanted another studio. So it was just one studio right after another. I worked for him for probably 20 years before we got married. Then we just worked day and night. And now Pete's from uh, Georgia originally, right? He was born in Augusta and raised in Atlanta. Okay. And uh, when did he move to Nashville? 1959. Okay. And he worked for uh, Wilma Lee and Stoney Cooper and Marty Robbins, I think, right? Yes. Wow. On the road. That's amazing. In uh, 1964, he was voted the Instrumentalist of the Year by Cashbox Magazine and um, also the Instrumentalist of the Year by the Country Music Association in 1970. And then he was inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame's Walkway of Stars. And he's had so many, um, so many great awards that have come his way: the Atlanta Country Music Hall of Fame and Georgia Music Hall of Fame, and just a just a wonderful recognition of his great career. And the Musicians Hall of Fame. Well, tell me uh, one of the things that he was a pioneer, well known for, and, and I love to hear recordings with the talking steel guitar. And one of my favorites is a song that Ruby Wright did called Billy Broke My Heart at Walgreens, and I know Pete's doing the talking steel guitar on that one. How did that come about? Pete actually had that idea in Atlanta when he was a young boy. He lived next door to a deaf and dumb couple, and he actually thought that if someone could play an instrument with just one note, 
or a slide like on the steel, and they could form the words with their mouth. They could talk, and you could understand them as long as they were in front of an instrument. And Bill West and Luther Perkins was hanging out at the office, and Fred and uh, Pete was telling them about this. And when he told them, they decided, well, maybe we can engineer something because Bill West had an engineering degree. So they worked on it for a few days and they came in and they, you know, they would try it and then that didn't work and they'd try something else. Eventually they came up with the talk box. Pete was actually trying the talk box on uh, Roger Miller, Lock, Stock, and Teardrops. Oh, yeah. And Jerry Kennedy heard him, and Jerry Kennedy was producing Roger, and he was head of Mercury. He and Shelby Singleton were head of Mercury here in Nashville. And then they asked Pete if he would record an album with the talk box. And then when Pete went to work with George Harrison in the UK, he gave it to Peter Frampton because Peter Frampton was there hanging out at the sessions. And Peter had heard it when he was a young boy living in South Africa. So Pete left his talk box there with Peter. And then Peter, a few years later, adjusted it so that he could use it while he was walking around on stage. Mm -hmm. Pete needed his in a box so it could sit on his steel guitar. But Peter needed to put his over his shoulder. And then Joe Wash came by the office when he was uh, just a guitar player, a new guitar player in town, and Pete gave him one of his talk boxes. And so it just kept the pattern going of who Pete had helped during all those years, and they just kept talking about Pete, and it was wonderful. That's amazing. And Pete played on a lot of uh, rock and roll records, too, for, for Elvis and Carl Perkins and Neil Young and Bob Dylan and just a lot of, besides the country ones, too, right? Yes, a lot of it. He did three albums with Bob Dylan. He did, uh, I think it was four movies with Elvis. Wow. And he did the George Harrison, the All Things Must Pass album, mm -hmm. which they've just re-released, remastered and re-released. And they changed some of the musicians that happened twice. George remixed it and released it, but he left Pete's part on. And now George's son has remixed it and released it, but he left Pete's part on there. Well, Pete also uh, did a lot of uh, great session work, as we had mentioned, a lot of great songs. And he, uh, he also had Window Music Publishing, right? Yes. A lot of great songs came came from that catalog too, from Jim Reeves and Dottie West and Johnny Rodriguez. I mean, just a incredible list. And uh, we're going to play all, all the songs we're going to play after this interview are things that either Pete played on or produced or had a hand on. So it's a pretty impressive. Well, great. Yeah, it's a pretty impressive body of work. Um, I want to ask you too about uh, Pete's place, uh, his recording studio. I know that that was a, a well known and uh, uh, highly respected recording studio. Well, when Pete came back from England working with George Harrison, the studio that they worked in, in in London was just a small studio so everybody could sit around and hear each other. And so Pete, he said one day, I think that I want one of those studios. So it was a two-story building. So he decided this like on a Friday night. There was a group by the name of the Calhoun Twins, mm -hmm. Jerry and Jack Calhoun. Mm -hmm. They were in Nashville doing the Opry. They were contractors. And so when they heard Pete say that, they said, well, well, you know, when we get through with the Opry tomorrow night, we can, make, we can build you a studio. So they came in about 10 o'clock at night and started knocking walls down. And by Monday morning, they had the outline of the studio where the Every instrument was going to go. We knew how big the room was going to be, where the control room was going to be. And so Pete called the sound people in. They sent up their head carpenter 
to build the actual walls and stuff because they had only done the stud. Mm -hmm. And it become a studio. And because Pete was one of those people that stayed up all night anyway, then uh, he would stay in that studio every night after he finished his other sessions, and it become a hangout place on Music Row. And if anyone didn't have any place to go at night, that's where they showed up. So at any time, you could walk in, and legends could just be hanging out and, you know, sitting in a session or having coffee and a lot of stories. Well, one of the um, wonderful bodies of work that exists is uh, from a label called First Generation Records. And uh, I know that, that that you and Pete started that record label. And, and tell me the story of how that came about. And, and you are still active with that label today, too. Yeah, we kept all the companies active, actually. That was one of my instructions from Pete before he passed, is that he wanted to keep his name and Ernest Tubbs' name alive. And so that's what we've tried to do all these years. Because the music business has changed, then we had to kind of change the structure. But we still have everything available online. It's really amazing how many people still want Ernest Tubbs product. He couldn't find Ernest Tubb a record deal after MCA dropped him. And he just couldn't believe that any record label would ever say no to Ernest Tubb. So he came home one day and he said, we're going to start a label and we're going to promote Ernest Tubb. So that's what we did. And then he started signing other Grand Ole Opry acts that were having a hard time finding a record label. And so we've just tried to keep those names alive. Most of them are gone now, but uh, Ray Pilla is still here. And um, we just try to keep everything going the way that we think that Pete would have enjoyed it. We put videos up. We try to just find all the press that we can on all of these people to keep things going. I play a lot of uh, records from the First Generation series, the stars of the Grand Ole Opry. There are some great albums. Uh, gosh, Gene Shepard, and as you mentioned, Ray Pillow, Stonewall Jackson, uh, Justin Tubb, Billy Walker, just, the list just goes on, and uh, wonderful. And folks, I do want to mention, too, you can visit uh, PeteDrake.net is the website, and I believe that uh, all those First Generation recordings are available on that website. Is that correct? They are. Or countryrecords.com. Okay, folks, we will put all that information on our Facebook page for you as well. And then there's also a great Facebook page called Pete Drake Music and Friends. And we'll put that link on our site for you as well so you can check that out. Um, one of the great projects from First Generation that I wanted to ask about, Rose, was the, uh, the Legend and the Legacy project with Ernest Tubb. When Pete couldn't find E.T. Uh, a record label, he needed to come up with a different way to promote Ernest. So while Ernest was on the road, then he brought, he recorded like 24 tracks on Ernest. And then when Ernest was on the road, he brought all these guest artists in to record without Ernest knowing it. And we gave that project to Ernest for his 65th birthday. And we had a big party at the Exit Inn. Even Peter Fonda came. Oh, wow. And what was really funny was when Ernest met Peter Fonda, he said, Son, I don't think too much of your movies, but I sure do like your daddy. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and Peter just stood there with his mouth open. He didn't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was E.T. So we had artists like Willie Nelson and Waylon and Marty Robbins and George Jones and Vern Gosden, Cal Smith, Loretta and Conway, uh, Charlie Daniels, uh, Charlie McCoy, Johnny Paycheck. You know, anybody that wanted to record with Ernest was invited. And these people, they were just, they would have to slip in and out of the studio. And if Pete had someone set up to record, and Ernest would just show up in his little Volkswagen. Then we'd have to cancel everything. It was like, 
about two or three months of just sneaking Ernest in and out of the studio when uh, and all these different artists because they were trying to keep it a secret. <laughs> and then the day that they played it for Ernest, Owen Bradley was there. Ernest just cried. Wow. He was just so impressed that all these people wanted to do duets with him. Well, it's a stellar project and uh, still available, as we mentioned. Um, one of the things I was curious about, um, after they told Ernest about this and played this for them, did he go back in then and, and record? Because I know there's some parts in those songs where he, you know, he says, you know, take it, Merle, or somebody. So I assume he must have gone back in and re-recorded those, those parts after that. He did, yes. Now, there was a collection that a, a record label, I think it was called Laser Light, released um, of those recordings, but there there were more than what were on the original album. Were those done later? They went back in after the original album was released and did some more tracks because people kept coming wanting to record. They just wanted to be on the album. So Pete would let anyone that wanted to record with him that was a name artist just come in and record and then they put those on that and that was just a distribution deal because we were trying to sell product on Ernest Tubb and get his name out there sure and we were just a small independent label you know and small independent labels don't have a lot of money because we were doing it out of our pocket then we did a distribution deal with laser light that's a great project. I, I love those songs so much. And uh, David McCormick was on my show recently, and uh, he cited the um, Ernest Tubb. Uh, there's a two-CD collection of, of where uh, you released just, just the recordings of Ernest singing, and uh, David cites those as his very favorite recordings on Ernest Tubb. He just really loves that collection, and I always encourage people to pick that up too. David's a great guy. He sure is, and that's a that's a wonderful collection and a wonderful body of work. And I'm so glad that uh, that Pete did that because uh, so many of those recordings were um, done at different times, and and for Ernest to go in and re-record those and with you know great music and j he just sounded so fantastic. It's such a nice collection to have. And those were his last recordings. If I'm not mistaken, now Pete's brother uh, Jack was was also a member of the Texas Troubadours for quite a few years. 26 years. Wow. He so, played bass for Ernest. So you definitely had a great connection with Ernest Tubb. That's wonderful. Jack, he still helped Ernest all that he could, you know, after he retired from the road. Well, I, this might be a hard question to uh, to answer, but um, what, are, what are some standout songs, just for you personally, that, that you really just love maybe above a little bit above the other ones that that pete either recorded himself or recorded with other artists well my favorite that he recorded is the song pleading that he recorded for star day records actually the first time and then you know for pete's sake was the theme song of the grand Ole opry warm-up show with grant turner for 24 years so I like that song a lot because, you know, it's just kind of what I grew up with, I guess. Sure. And then the ones that he played on is Tammy Wynette, Stand By Your Man, Charlie Rich, Most Beautiful Girl, George Jones, He Stopped Loving Her Today. I think those are my three favorite. Well, those are good ones. We're going to play all of those tonight for our listeners. Good. Well, again, this is a um, this is a wonderful thing that uh, Pete is is being inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame, and I'm so glad that uh, they have recognized. There are so many, in my opinion, there are so many artists that still need to be in the Country Music Hall of Fame, but they sure they sure made up for some some lost ground by putting Pete in there this year. I think that's a wonderful thing, and congratulations. Thank you. PeteDrake.net is the website, and we'll put all that information on our Facebook page. And we're going to play a whole bunch of these fabulous songs from Pete Drake as we continue with My Kind of Country. And, Rose, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking time to share some of your music and memories with us today. Thank you so much. It was fun. <laughs> 